So welcome to this uh, short lecture on the philosophy of models. I'm Raphael. This is part of the crash course in evolutionary biology. In this lecture, I want to give you, a, I want to cover uh, the question: Why do we use models in evolutionary biology or in ecology and evolution in general? What are the different types of models, and why do we choose? Why do we choose certain types of models uh, over other, over other? Others. So, if you follow this course, uh, hopefully you've uh, come across a variety of models already, from uh, model simulations of quantitative genetics, where with the, where the assemblage of different alleles and different loci uh, can produce continuously distributed characters, to uh, individual base simulations on the um, evolution of aging. Uh, or you may have learned about this esoteric uh, modeling framework called adaptive dynamics. Uh, or even th seen like uh, examples of models of population genetics with changes in allele frequencies through time. These are all models and in this lecture I want to give you a sense of why we use models so much in ecology and evolution basically. Uh, but also I want to uh, give you a sense of what are the different types of models that you might expect to encounter in the literature specifically if you continue this path and even if you're going for a more empirical um, uh, path because you will most certainly encounter models regardless and it turns out that model can mean very different things to different people. And so why are we using models so much in evolutionary biology? Well, what is a model? A model is a representation of reality or is a, is a simplification, a simplified representation of reality that uh, contains what we think are the key elements to understand how the real world uh, really works. Uh, particularly for a certain phenomenon that we're interested in. And basically, the theory of evolution itself is a model. It is a, an idea, uh, Charles Darwin's th theory, uh, to, to start with, is basically his idea of how evolution works, of how the world uh, works. And it does make a lot of, abstra of abstractions, but that allows uh, Charles Darwin, in his uh, uh, derivation of the theory, basically, to... Uh, pinpoint what are the key elements that he thinks are essential for evolution by natural selection to occur. And for him it was uh, the uh, variation in uh, traits in the population, the fact that they should be heritable to some extent, and the fact that they should correlate uh, with fitness. So models are these representations of how we think the world works in a, sim in a simplified way. And evolutionary biology, in a sense, is a field that has been heavily fueled by this uh, back and forth between uh, uh, models being made and empirical research uh, confirming or infirming these models, leading to new data or new results that would inspire new models to, make, to take those observations into account, and then uh, further empirical studies that would aim at confirming, the confirming uh, or, or testing uh, those models further. And the reason is basically that evolution is something that is complicated to see. It does take time. It is not immediately obvious that it is hap that it is happening. Now it is much more and it's much more accepted, right? Because if you look for it, you will find lots of uh, data that support it. But to a completely uh, naive mind, it is very not obvious that uh, this process might be happening at all. And identifying it relies on a lot of indirect evidence. And this is basically why we need models. We, because we do not see exactly what is happening or what has happened and how it happened, uh, we need to come up with stories of what we think happened, which is basically what models are. This is like a crime scene reconstruction. After the fact, all we can do is come up with theories for uh, what has happened, uh, and then uh, based on these theories, derive, based on these models, derive uh, expected uh, expected patterns that we should see in order to, to confirm uh, those different uh, models, those different predictions. And it's the same thing in evolutionary biology. We have uh, uh, doubts about how exactly evolution happened, whether, whether it's regarding the evolution of, of vigilance in some uh, mammals or the evolution of uh, coloration in, in some fish or, or something else. What we can do is come up with theories as for why we think uh, those things evolved and how we think they evolved and make, bring, make predictions that can then be uh, uh, tested uh, using uh, data from the real world by empiricists. Of course, those models should make 
predictions that can be test that can be tested uh, for this to happen, for this real communication, this back and forth between theoretical science and empirical science to be able to unfold. And this is how insights have been generated in evolutionary biology for a long time. So all of the, the main uh, things that we teach when we teach evolution are conceptual models, right? These are models, uh, population genetics, quantitative genetics, uh, adaptive dynamics to a lesser extent. This one is a little bit more niche, but in any um, topic, you would probably, topics such as the evolution of sex, the evolution of diploidy, multicellularity, and all sorts of evolutionary problems, you would probably hear different theories that people have proposed for uh, the evolution of those things, and then uh, empirical tests of those uh, theories, and sometimes the answers are inconclusive. So evolutionary biology really relies on the establishment of models to move things further, basically, which those end up being attempts at explaining uh, how the world works or what are the important bits uh, in how the world works based on inspiration that we have from what we see in nature or from a results of previous experiments or previous empirical science. And so this reconstruction of crime scene that I mentioned, and so this reconstruction of crime scene that I mentioned before is basically, for example, what we did uh, in uh, phylogenetic reconstruction. Uh, when we want to reconstruct a phylogeny, we have, uh, cert we have a crime that has happened. And the crime is that we have whales and hippos and pigs and, and, and deers and all kinds of uh, cetarchidactyla um, at present. And what we're wondering is who is most related to whom. Uh, that is the crime scene that we're trying to reconstruct. That is the story that we're trying to unravel. So we might have different hypotheses that uh, whales branch at the base of all of the other cetarchidactyla, or that whales are most related to hippos, or that whales are more related to uh, cows, for example. Uh, and uh, those different, uh, based on those different stories, we can make a more complicated model. So these would consider would be considered model a, a model that says that ca that whales are most related to hippos, a model that says that whales are more related to cows. But we can, but these are uh, so-called verbal models. They are not, they do not have any mathematical essence. We can just uh, explain them very briefly just just by by, by saying them. Uh, of course we can give them a little bit more substance because what we're inter interested in is to be able to compare the different models and to be able to pick the hypothesis that is the most likely or that is the most uh, yeah likely to be true. So what we do is, what we do is we uh, conceptualize those things. We imagine that the patterns of DNA alignment that we might uh, have as data could be explained by different scenarios. They might be explained by uh, changes in by substitutions uh, from some nucleotides to other nucle other nucleotides uh, through time uh, with certain rates. So that's uh, one way to mathematically en encapsulate already the processes that we think happened, that we think gave rise to the observations that we see, so the DNA alignments in the case of phylogenetic reconstruction. And under each of the scenarios that we have, under each of the hypotheses, under each model, we can um, basically uh, predict what uh, sort of alignments, what sort of data we would see if uh, whales were uh, more related to hypo the hippos, for example. If that was the case, we would see a lot of uh, base pairs in the DNA um, uh, being very similar between whales and hippos and less similar with other uh, uh, lineages, basically. And this is how we go about it. Then we find, of course, uh, complicated computational algorithms that will do the job for us uh, of telling which uh, scenario is the most likely. And then so we have fancy ways of picking which model represents is the, is the best representation of reality. But this is best, basically what we do. Uh, when we reconstruct this type of crime scene. Now, I also really want to take you to take home the message here that uh, model means different things for different people. Now, different kinds of models, uh, and by all means, this doesn't need to be uh, uh, an all-encompassing classification. It's just one way of seeing uh, the difference between certain types of models. There might be other ways, but generally, uh, models can fall along a continuum uh, between very mechanistic models and very phenomenological models. So what does that mean? Mechanistic models are models that would basically more explicitly take into account certain processes that are giving rise to patterns or to phenomena that are happening in, in, in the model. Uh, so they take into account the underlying mechanisms of what is happening, while the more phenomenological models tend to be more abstract, tend to uh, blur uh, 
those mechanisms, those underlying processes into random variables or stochastic processes or, 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 or simple rates, for example, simple probabilities without really explaining how those events come about in the model. So, of course, these are not uh, absolute terms. So uh, a model is never just mechanistic or phenomenological. You can o but the idea is that you can argue that a model might be more phenomenological than some other model. Uh, for example, a model of quantitative genetics that assumes that a population is a normal distribution of trade values with a, a mean and a standard deviation, and that those are basically the two parameters that matter, and then of course uh, that there is some, some sort of value for the additive variance or the heritability, and that allows you to determine how uh, the trait is going to change and the mean trait of the population is going to change from one generation to the other. Uh, one might argue that this model is way more phenomenological than, an, so let's say, an individual-based simulation where we simulate in a virtual world lots of individuals with lots of genes, and all those genes code for uh, the trait that is evolving in some intricate ways using some gene networks or using some dominance-recessivity relationships, for example, and all kinds of complications like transcription, factor binding sites or things like that with a lot more considerations about the cellular mechanisms and the molecular mechanisms that give rise to phenotypes from genotype. Uh, that model would be more mechanistic than the quantitative genetics model. But even a model of, uh, even a, a model, an individual based model that doesn't have all these intricacies but just has, you know, just has additive genetics which is, as we saw in quantitative genetics, a very unrealistic assumption for how uh, real life uh, organisms really work, but if we were making a fictional model basically uh, where our organism would be built like this, uh, if it was an individual based simulation where each individual possesses some genes even though they code additively for the phenotype and that's unrealistic, that might still be more mechanistic than uh, representing the population by just normal distribution. Now, each kind of model might very well have their own advantages, of course, and something we already said in the lecture on adaptive dynamics. Uh, perhaps uh, for a given question that we're asking where we realize that we need models to tackle that question, a plurality of modeling approaches might be uh, preferable so that each the advantage of each technique basically uh, circumvent, in a sense, the pitfalls of other techniques. So it is not necessarily a given that mechanistic models, because they make more... Uh, explicit assumptions about the mechanisms that are going on in the in, in the model are always better. For example, uh, one may argue that more mechanistic models make uh, a lot more uh, assumption and therefore become much more uh, uh, specific and lose in generality of their conclusions. Another aspect to consider is that more mechanistic models are often way more complex, which uh, prevents some anal an analysis techniques from being used on them, which uh, might be a problem sometimes. So more phenomenological models are more amenable, for example, to analytical treatment. This is when we study the behavior of the, of the model analytically without having to simulate it, without having to uh, numerically run the numbers and look at what evolution uh, does at the end of it, uh, but we can use uh, uh, some functions or some mathematical tools, like in adaptive dynamics, basically, to directly have access to uh, the predicted evolutionary equilibrium that a given system will reach. That might be a problem with mechanistic models, where we will then have to rely on running lots of simulations, and we may miss some patterns just because we cannot cover the entirety of parameter space sometimes uh, when this gets too huge with just simulations. Another handy aspect of, phenomenal, of more phenomenological models is that because they uh, are phenomenological, because they rely on fewer building blocks and are often fewer parameters, they are often easier to fit. So we talked a lot in uh, phylogenetic reconstruction, for example, or phylogenetic methods, that uh, we come up with models of evolution of substitutions uh, between nucleotides or uh, and, and, and to choose between different tree topologies or we make assumptions about the evolution of traits along the branches of a phylogeny in uh, phylogenetic comparative methods and ancestral character reconstruction. When we do this, we use models that are very simple in their building blocks. They only have a few parameters, and that makes them very easy to fit to data because a likelihood function can be uh, provide, produced from them, for them. So these models are often stochastic, which means that uh, they rely on, probability, uh, on probabilities, and you can basically use that
to come up with a uh, formula for the likelihood of some data given the model and if you have as we said in those lectures uh, if you have a function for that uh, you might be able to fit your model to some data and to come up with the most likely scenario of who is more related to whom is it uh, hippos that are the most clo the closest relative to to whales or not uh, of what is the best uh, the, the most likely ancestral character state for a given for a given trait that you're studying in a given clade that you're studying uh, all those uh, answer you would get by fitting your theoretical model to some data and you can only fit it if you have a criterion to fit it so having a likelihood function is one such criterion uh, but derive being able to derive the likelihood in the first place uh, re requires the model that the model is relatively simple if you complexify the model by adding all sorts of details uh, like uh, the genetic architecture of the trace and the different uh, gene gene interactions that there is and also protein protein interactions and all sorts of things uh, you might very quickly lose the ability to mathematically come up with a likelihood function for your model which would make it easily to simulate you would still be able to simulate the model that you have created and see what it does in its vacuum world but will, you will no longer be able to derive a likelihood that would uh, allow you to uh, fit it to some data and to learn something about some real world data that you have uh, so the take home message here here is that a portion of like models in this universe of models is used to learn stuff about real world data and those are statistical models statistical models are models that we are fitting to real world data in order to learn something about those real world data and those have certain requirements basically to be able to be fitted to real world data and that is something that's important to keep in mind. And so an example, for example, uh, and, and so an example of that is the brown and mo brown in motion model, for example, is, which is certainly the simplest uh, model you can think of for the evolution of a continuous trait along the branches of a phylogeny. When you do ancestral character reconstruction or you account for phylogenetic relatedness, uh, this uh, model is co very commonly used. But it's make it it's making incredibly simplistic assumptions, and so the question, of course, is once you fit the brown in motion to your data, how much should you trust the results of the ancestral character reconstruction you've just run? It relies on the validity of the assumption of your brown in motion, which are certainly almost certainly wrong, almost certainly violated in the real world. And the question is, how big of a deal is that? If you were uh, modeling the evolu, you could model the evolution of your trait along the branches of your phylogeny with more complicated uh, uh, models. For example, the ornstein uhlenbeck does account for uh, selection, which the Brunnen motion model does not. Uh, but it still makes very simplistic assumptions about lots of things. It doesn't assume genes. It doesn't assume things like recombination. It doesn't assume that there might be a migration between different populations. Uh, it's completely agnostic about this. Um, and, and basically makes the assumption that those things are irrelevant and are, and are not really mattering for the problem at hand. Whether or not that is true is a different problem, but in any case, coming up with a f fitting uh, a, a more complicated model like this that includes a lot of more processes, a lot more mechanisms, so a more mechanistic model to these uh, trait data when we do ancestral character reconstruction might be just prohibitively complicated. And so while we have statistical models on the one hand, which often tend to be phenomenological models because they are simple enough that uh, we can come up with likelihood functions for them and that they can be uh, fitted to some uh, real-world data and tell us something about those real-world data. Um, on the other hand, some other models are used uh, in order to get insights into different processes, into what sort of uh, patterns are generated by different processes, what sort of phenomena emerge from different processes or different mechanisms. So those... Uh, models tend generally to be more mechanistic although you, you we can also get lots of insights sometimes from more phenomenological models and this is what i mean by uh, the word model means different things to different people it happens that people get confused when someone talks about a model but actually means a, a very simplistic model that they intend to keep simple on purpose because they want to fit it to data and reconstruct the past population sizes of a population of walruses because they have gene and ancient DNA genome data, for example.
or they want to perform ancestral character reconstruction they have to keep their model simple because they want to fit into some data so just mentioning a model might sound very confusing to someone who is also working with models but more used to the sort of models that uh, that is aimed at ma generating insights about some evolutionary processes and those models would oftentimes invoke more mechanism look at how the genome organization affects the type of evolution that, that evolves, how the types of mating system affects the type of evolution that, evo that evolves, the type of trait that evolves. Um, the uh, adaptive dynamics framework is basically a, a framework of, of models made to generate insight. This is really what it is about, uh, asking questions about what evolution would do or evolution by selection would do in this or that case and making that case happen in a vacuum world in a sense, and looking at how that works uh, concretely and maybe back, uh, backing up those predictions with other models that are equally made to make to generate insight just using different techniques. So for example, individual based simulations or population genetics instead of uh, adaptive dynamics. But those models would typically be used to generate insights about how evolution works. And you would typically go for very different modeling choices into designing those models and because all models rely on assumptions and what makes a model is really the choices that you are making into when you're designing the model it is important to be aware that uh, you would make different choices of assumptions depending on the goal that you want to achieve with your model is it something that you a model that you want to make in order to get insight into some process that you want to better understand or is it a model that you want to make in order to be able to fit it to some real world data and learn something about that real, real world data and the last thing I want to talk about here is uh, assumptions, or, or in particular, assumption violations. So if you've run statistical models or, or the statistical tests of uh, hypotheses, you know that most statistical tests come with a, a range of assumptions, for example, uh, normality of residuals in the case of linear regression-based uh, 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 methods, also the independence of the residuals, equality of variances, things like that. Uh, and typically, you know that when you're fitting those model to you, those models or those tests to your data, you are supposed to check the assumptions whether your uh, data set is violating those assumptions of the model. And if so, perhaps use a different, more accurate uh, statistical test uh, for your data. Now, that is important to do, but here I want to say that it is not necessarily because the assumptions of a model are violated that the conclusions uh, are automatically untrustworthy. Now, I'm not advocating at all for not checking the assumptions of your statistical test and or, or running them regardless of the violation of their assumptions. Uh, by all means, check the assumptions and uh, try it as best as best as you can to fit um, uh, models to models to data that respect the assumptions of those models. But in, in many cases, it's possible that models still make accurate, relatively accurate predictions, uh, even when some of their assumptions are violated. One example of this, for example, is in the very famous uh, ANOVA analysis, analysis of variance that is used in, in many uh, fields. So like this very uh, famous statistical test, uh, which basically assumes a very similar uh, assumption uh, as the linear regression does, so normality of the residuals, uh, also uh, equality of variances across groups and uh, independence of data points, no outliers. It turns out that the analysis of variance is much more sensitive to deviations from equality of variances or is much more sensitive to the presence of outliers than it is to norm normality of the residuals. So uh, data that uh, ticks all the boxes but is not normally distributed or slightly not normally distributed might still be fine when being uh, uh, run through an ANOVA. So typically people who make statistical procedures and statistical tests will also come up with um, uh, so-called robustness studies where they will generate uh, simulate random data sets that do deviate in some way from the assumptions of the statistical test then fit their statistical test to those data and see how much error uh, those are making they, and they know how much error the test is making because they have simulated generated the data uh, themselves and so that means that Statistical tests and models are sometimes more sensitive to violations of some of their assumptions than others, and are therefore more robust to violations of assumptions in some uh, of some of their assumptions uh, than others. And this is to say that it's not because the assumption of a model is um, 
uh, violated or unrealistic or just doesn't match the reality of the things we're dealing with that we're trying to tackle with this model doesn't necessarily mean that automatically the, con the conclusion of the model are not trustworthy. And another a good example of this is quantitative genetics and the additive uh, model of quantitative genetics where quantitative genetics basically assume this extremely unrealistic way in which the genotypes code for the phenotype by assuming these additive effects of different alleles that all sum up in an independent way to form the phenotype. We know that this is not how the genotype phenotype map works. This is not how real or real life organisms work. Uh, the genotype codes for the phenotypes in much more intricate ways and is actually doubtful whether additive effects exist at all. Uh, but making this assumption nevertheless allows quantitative genetics to come up with surprisingly accurate ways to predict the evolution, at least in the short term, of some quantitative traits under selection. Now, of course, the non-realism of those underlying assumptions are also probably the cause of uh, why quantitative genetics cannot make predictions in the long term. But nevertheless, even though the model is highly unrealistic, it su it's surprisingly good at, makes prediction, at making some predictions about evolution. And this goes to say that how bad it is that the assumption of a model is not very realistic really ultimately depends on uh, the goal that we have for this model. For example, uh, the goal of this additive model of quantitative genetics is not to be an accurate representation of how the genotype-phenotype map really is or really works. If we wanted to do that, we would have gone for an actual model of the genotype-phenotype map, not quantitative genetics. In quantitative genetics, we explicitly choose to go for a simple representation of the genetic basis of traits because we want to derive for some more general insights into how the traits change at least on the short term and so one can argue that for the purpose of that model it actually the purpose is actually met fine uh, uh, even though the uh, assumptions are unrealistic so we may even say that the, these unrealistic assumptions are a good enough approximation of reality at least for the purpose of that model so the validity of assumptions really depends on the uh, goal we want to achieve. And the same thing applies to models that are not necessarily statistical, models that uh, we use to get insights into evolutionary processes and not necessarily insights into some data set that we want to fit them to. The same is true there. It's not because an assumption is unrealistic that it makes the uh, conclusions of the model necessarily, or the insights generated by the model necessarily uh, rubbish and becomes really extremely clear in those types of models because any assumption is going to be an approximation of reality and so is going to be a simplification of reality. It's going to be unrealistic in some way, regardless of the model that we're thinking of. No model is going to be just as complicated as nature, otherwise it wouldn't be a model anymore. It would be nature. And that doesn't necessarily mean that all those models are useless. What we did, for example, in the adaptive dynamics lecture with the vigilance example was to um, uh, expand our, our, some initial model that we considered was a bit too simple by adding some more uh, factors that we thought were really important about uh, to understand the evolution of the, trait we were, of the trait we were studying. So we added life in a group. We also added the dilution effect of living in a group and uh, uh, the, the fact that many eyes can see more than one single pair of eyes. We also added frequency dependent selection, which we thought was important. And we can com come up with an infinity of extensions of the model and make it ever uh, more uh, precise, basically. Now, because we can do that doesn't mean that what we have derived already with our models that we have already made is completely useless. They actually can teach us quite a lot about evolution. And despi despite their unrealistic assumptions, they may still make relatively accurate predictions or generate relatively accurate insights about how the world really works. And actually, the exercise that we did in this adaptive dynamics example of like expanding the model and comparing the output of different types of model of models is perhaps the most valuable exercise that we can do in this in this sort of like modeling endeavor because different models of different modeling frameworks may each have their own advantages and circumvent in some way some of the pitfalls of other uh, models or modeling frameworks. Just like we said that comparing individual based simulations that include genetic drift for example to what we would have expected or predicted based on adaptive dynamics or so selection alone uh, is a very useful exercise because then we can 
tell apart and disentangle better which evolutionary patterns are accounted for by selection and which are uh, accounted for by other things such as drift. And so perhaps a uh, useful way to go about generating insights that might be more trustworthy with our models might be, well, first to have a good knowledge of the thing that we're trying to model because that will inform the best choices and the best practices, like the, the best choices we can make uh, to come up uh, with a valid fitness function, for example, in an adaptive, adaptive dynamics uh, exercise. But also if we're not sure uh, which assumptions are, whether an assumption is, is uh, too unrealistic to be trustworthy, we may also want to just generate another version of the model where we relax this assumption and see what the comparison is, we see what the result is. Does it matter a lot? Does it not matter? Regardless, we would have learned something. If it doesn't matter, we will have figured out that uh, actually uh, the approximation that we had made was good enough uh, in order for the conclusions that we wanted to reach. And if uh, there's a difference, then we know that this element is actually matters quite a bit for the evolutionary question that we are trying to answer. And uh, really the last thing that I want to mention is that, well, in the recent years with the uh, advances in uh, uh, artificial intelligence and computing uh, and machine learning techniques, basically, in the world of statistical models, more and more people have moved away from a likelihood-based uh, fitting of uh, some models to data and move more into uh, different techniques for trying to fit models to data, different techniques that basically allow to fit models to data that previously could not be fitted because we could not come up with a likelihood function for them. So I said that statistical models tend to be on the end of the spectrum towards more the phenomenological models because they make they only uh, rely on a few parameters and that makes it easier to uh, come up with criteria like the likelihood function to uh, fit them to some real world data. Uh, people are moving away from this um, using artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to be able to uh, take models that basically are more complicated for which we do not have necessarily a likelihood function, simulate them, making them produce lots of, and generate lots and lots of data, learning from those data what sort of patterns to expect under this or that parameter regime or this or that circumstances, and look in real world data whether they can infer uh, what, uh, if the model had produced this real world data, what the parameters would have been, uh, depending on what the machine has learned from the, the, its training data set. So, this sort of enhanced techniques basically allows to uh, fit models to data that are more complicated than 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 what used to be uh, fitable to data. Now, of course, this has just like any framework, any 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 way of using models. Uh, this also has some pitfalls. Uh, of course, uh, the generalization ability of, the, of those machines that we're using depends heavily on what data it was trained with, right? So it's not because the observed data looks like something that the, some of the simulations that the machine has encountered in its training data that is necessarily that same uh, process that generated the data we see out there. Uh, so that happens mostly in the fields of genomics where people are trying to infer past events based on the genetic sequences that they are um, obtaining from sequencing species basically uh, where um, uh, deviating from more classical li classical likelihood based approaches allows people to test for some more complicated hypotheses about what may have happened uh, in the past, uh, and so people would go for uh, methods using, for example, this so-called approximate Bayesian computation, which deviates a little bit from from likelihood based um, uh, methods, but also uh, like proper machine learning, like multi-layer perceptrons or convolutional neural networks. These are just terms that of, of uh, state-of-the-art uh, methods are being used. I'm not going to go into detail about them. You can Google them if you like. But this is really where this is going. And so in the future, it may very well be possible to, uh, or it may be just as commonly seen, to fit uh, complicated models to real-world data than the fitting of uh, uh, simple or, or more of more simple models of course with all the caveats that that come with it and one other of them is for example that with lots of parameters involved in a model because a model might be more mechanistic more complicated it might be completely impossible to tell apart different combinations of multiple parameters just because they would generate the exact same patterns the exact same data even in the simulated data set so this was the few things i wanted to say about models in general and their use in ecology and evolution uh, it's relatively simple and just a few generalities that I think are important to keep in mind 
uh, as you move on, uh, especially if you stay within this field and you, uh, and, and you are very likely to encounter those terms in the future. Uh, and I think it's important that you are aware of what the sort of different things uh, are there, not necessarily exactly which type of mo which types of models, which types of algorithms are being used, but what what are the usefulness of different models? What are, what's the rational being using certain models instead of others? Which models for what purpose? And def uh, and therefore being aware that the purpose of a model determines the assumptions that go into it. So that was a mini lecture on the philosophy of models and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for listening.